So this evening I'm talking about doing life together. And obviously we're going to watch rugby together, so it was a teaching moment. We're going to talk about doing life together, about living together. And, um, you know, our culture is so individualistic and competitive. It's about me making it, me being happy first before anyone else is happy. It's, it's, really, it's really our culture. It's, it's a drivenness. It's a drivenness and a self-dependence, an interdependence, or a, a independence of everyone else. Pride is what we call the is blissful independence. Humility is happy dependence on God or on someone else. So it's really the thing. So tonight I want to talk about doing life together. And, and I think the main thesis, there's a lot of echo here. But the main thesis that I want us, want us to get tonight is the fact that the goal of Jesus' is coming to earth was for us to be formed into a selfless, loving, inclusive, hospitable community like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The goal is really community. God is forever, may Daniel McGlory, self-giving, other-regarding, community-forming love. I want you to really, sometime in the week, you've heard me say this a thousand times, but just to meditate on that sentence, God is eternally self-giving, other-regarding, community-forming love. So someone who really looks like God A community that really looks like God is a community that is selfless in generosity, extremely hospitable, receiving the others in, those who are not like me, call them family. And then the last one is other regarding, to consider the needs of the others more important than yourself. So I just want us to keep that in mind as we spoke about being, spoke about being, as we speak about being um, community. So, Psalm 133, how wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in sweet unity. There are many translations for this sentence, but it comes down to the fact that life really happens when there is a trusting, receptive, other, other regarding community. When people walk in and feel love, feel accepted, feel belonging, feel empowered, because you don't just live for you. I don't have to meet your standards, but you open your heart for me. That's really what the Bible speaks about here, and it speaks about a life, and then the sentence it is, and that it says, it's, it's, like the, it's like the anointing oil that runs down Aaron's bear, except it, it's like dew that falls on Mount Hermon in the desert, and then somehow it gives life to the Jordan River, and everywhere along this Jordan River in the, in the desert, there are oases, and there are vegetation, makes life possible. It, it, it says it gives life. It gives life. It really gives life. Jesus' command up against that wall. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. It's very simple, eh? Verskrikkelijk moeilijk. It's verskrikkelijk moeilijk. So what we say at every wedding. Okay, so what's the command? Love one another. Love one another. It's simple. If it gets tough, love one another. If it's lacquer, love one another. If you want to walk out, love one another. If you want to hurt each other, love one another. You know, if someone offends you, love the other. Anyway, just as I've loved you, that's the difficult part. Loving one another is easy, but Jesus' standards are a bit difficult. Eh? Just as I've loved you, so you should also love one another. And then this sentence, which uh, Francis Schaeffer says is the great apologetic. How do we know, how do we really know whether Jesus came to earth? He says, it's simple. Get to a life-giving, broken church community. Walk in and judge them. <laughs> if they have love one another. So this means that the love is visible from the outside. It's not a soft, fuzzy feeling on the inside. It's quite simply, can you see selflessness? Can you see generosity? Can you see kindness? Can you see humility? Can you see compassion? It's, it's flipping hard, this one. He says, Jesus says, this is the golden standard to see whether a community is a Jesus community or not. Doesn't matter how powerful they are in their demonstration of tongues and miracles and shandai, shandai, angels, cold dust coming from the sky. He says, stuff all that. I mean, Paul said that clashing symbols. Ne? He says, can you from the outside look in and say, wow, these people really like one another. They love one another. Even, they love even those they don't like. <laughs> they are kind and selfless 
to those that are not. It's just amazing. It's just this hectic. Jesus says that your love for one another will prove the world that you are my disciples. I love this translation, the message translation. You can, you can chew on this one for a very long time. So we're talking about doing life together, and I've got 13 minutes and six points. Yeah? 13 minutes and six points. Yeah? Radical hospitality, humble authenticity, life-giving encouragement, unmerited kindness, selfless serving, and grand generos generosity. And the goal this evening is not at the end of this short discussion that you memorize, because nothing here will be new for you. But the goal is just to simply re-evaluate your expectation and your definition of what you believe church is. Because Jesus came to reform a community. I love it. My one professor always says, remember that Jesus didn't come to make good Christians out of you. He came to make, remake good humans. It's to reform humanity into a loving community. That's the whole, under him, in him, with him as the goal and the standard for life. That's it. So let's go. Radical hospitality fosters belonging. Remember, God is eternally community forming. He's the one that receives the strangers. And you'll see straight throughout the New Testament that the main goal, and I only have a few verses up here just for, your, for my background, is just to, the goal of the Christian life, how do we do life together? Well, the first thing is a radical acceptance of the other. Radical acceptance of one who is not like me. And you know the story. You know how difficult it is because we live in a, in a pluralistic, difficult society, multicultural, multiracial, multi-opinionated. No? It's hectic. It's not that easy to receive someone who really is not like you. But he says, if someone comes and seeks Jesus, you receive this person into your community. Radical. He's, and then you'll see the verses. Therefore, welcome one another. And, and the welcoming, please remember when he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. I just want you to, don't do this now, no? <laughs> Except if you're married or intend to marry the one next to you. And my register is up there. Anyway. <laughs> but greet one another with a holy kiss. I just want you to get what he says. He says, listen, this is a sign of acceptance and trust. You come close, cheek against cheek, beard against beard, you know, or non-beard against non-beard, and just welcome the person. It's extremely intimate, extremely open, and the whole idea is to receive this one in, to welcome this one, to say, hey, I trust you. You are part of us. Radical. We, after the service, you can do that, or not do that if you don't want to. Anyway, <laughs> but the Bible says you must. Anyway, and, I, and, it, and with it, it also says, listen, when you receive, when you show hospitality, he says, try to outperform. He says, the competition is not that good except in this one. Outperform one another in showing honor. See how low you can go to lift the other one up. We can do that after the service as well. Eh? But the whole idea is to lift the other one, to make sure that the other one gets the better treatment, higher treatment, because really I consider you higher than myself. Because this is what Jesus did. Leaving his throne, coming down, becoming a servant, being born in a manger. How low can you go to exalt the other? Really just outperform one another in showing honor. It's a beautiful sign. And then it says, yeah, do this without complaining. Because I know what it feels like. I remember one day I was cleaning up the toddler room at the back. And it's one of those days where it wasn't my toddler. I know it wasn't my, my child. But we tried to have an office meeting. I'm coming in the morning. I'm usually here first. And... It's as though someone did violence to the teddies. <laughs> Some of the crocodiles and teddies just didn't make it after that service. And I'm thinking, and I'm walking in here, and I'm tired, and it was the morning service and the evening service. I had a busy weekend, and I come here, and I'm like, Ugh. I didn't, yes. How long must I be a pastor and still clean up teddy, teddy, teddy crumblings, you know, on a Monday morning? <laughs> and I'm on my knees, and I'm cleaning up the teddy tumblings and trying to clean up the place so we can have a meeting. And I'm grumbling. And the Lord said to me, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom to many. You want to be now my disciple? And I'm like, this lack of hospitality to vase when it's a nice meal, but to clean up afterwards is not so nice. And it's really this without grumbling. Just do it without grumbling. I took five minutes on the first point. Oh, we saw that. <laughs> it says here, next one, humble authenticity. Authenticity Life together fosters trust. 
if I'm genuine with you, and you can see there's no pretense, it takes you a while, it takes you a while, and let's be honest, all of us, all of us wear masks, all of us, all of us wear masks, over one of us do, the closer, the longer you live with someone, the more your masks fall intentionally, or you get caught out and your masks are no longer, vis it doesn't, it's a smoke screen, but the invitation here is to say, God, I, I don't want to pretend to be better than I am in this community, because in this community, at least I know that I'm not accepted based on my performance. I'm accepted based on your goodness, your compassion. And this is the intention. And, and, and you'll see that so much of the New Testament just invites us to live without hypocrisy, hypocrisy without a stage performance mask. Don't be an actor, hypocrisy. Be, be real, be honest, be truthful. And the invitation is really to be truthful and to be honest to those around you, to don't try to be better than you are, because there is no real unity if I'm constantly acting with you. It's amazing. Do you feel what getrouwd is? You know, after six months, you know, you can only pretend for so long, and then the real morning you shows up. And then it's like a rediscovery, but then you made the vow, and you should love one another, ne? But it's really that. The invitation is the longer we walk together, the longer we just like, I have to walk in the light. Don't say you don't have, don't, don't act as though you're a better person than you are. Walk in the light because then you have fellowship. Fellowship, literally, the Greek word kononios and metikos literally means to hold the same thing. We dream the same dream, we want this. Anyway, the dream, the point is to hold on to the same thing, to hold on to Jesus himself, yeah. And then it speaks about that. So doing life together means radical hospitality. It means humble authenticity. It means life-giving encouragement. It requires life-giving encouragement. Yes, I you think you've heard me say, speak about encouragement so much, but so much of the New Testament is written, in fact, Paul says in Romans 15 verse 4, that all of the Old Testament, every single Old Testament book, was written for our learning that through the encouragement and endurance of Scripture, we may abound in hope. The New Testament and Old Testament letters, every one of them, were written during a time of hardship that needed to remind the people of God, saying, God is good. God is here in this dark place. God is here. God is here in this tough time. It's written, the New Testament is written during three periods, all 34 New Testament books written in three periods, Emperor Domitian, Emperor Nero, and Emperor Tertullian. Zadri, Zdit, because of their persecution and killing of Christians, the letters were written to say, hey, wait fast, papi, <laughs> the era is here, the era is nabe. And Paul is saying, listen, all of the Old Testament was written with the same. The point is that the reason why we gather, Hebrews 10, the reason why we gather is to encourage one another. Not just in church, but in your small group, or when you meet up with your accountability or prayer partner. The reason why we gather is two things, encouragement and exhortation. Encouragement, God is going to come through. Don't worry, just hold on to it. Exhortation, come on. Come on. Don't let those hang, arms hang down. Don't let uh, those feeble knees, come on, shake up. You're stronger than you are. Come on, you made a vow to Jesus. Suck it up, go on, you know. This die, you know. This is what you can see in rugby. Every time that they have a water break, someone's like, ah, ankle. They just come together and they say, come on, guys, we're going to make it. And the other guy says, hey, pull yourself together. You must make it. Exhortation, encouragement. Eh? You'll see it now. When you're watching the rugby, let it speak to you. Let it minister to you. <laughs> Endurance. We will overcome. We will overcome. Simon, yeah. Anyway, build one another up, exhort one another. So life-given community necessitates and is built around exhortation and encouragement. A life-giving community also is built around unmerited kindness. We are the Jesus community. We are the Jesus community. We are the God community, self-giving, other-regarding community. For We are the people that have fellowship with God because God is extremely, extremely generous. Because God is kind. God is the kindest person there is. Most compassionate, kindest person there is who freely gives what we don't deserve, who gives himself, who gives the most costly gift he can 
for our goodness, not for his goodness. His life would have gone on, but because he's compassionate and kind. So we, our community is characterized by unmerited kindness. Your witness as a Christian person is characterized by unmerited kindness. Freely you've received, freely you give. This is who we are. We are a people that don't just exist for our comfort. Remember what um, we started the Salvation Army? Sure, his name escapes me now. He's famous, he's famous to say that we are the one community society on earth that doesn't exist for the benefits of its members. We are the one society on earth that exists for the benefits of the non-members. <laughs> it's amazing, no? It's really amazing. We live in harmony with one another, be kind to one another, forgive one another. So our community and every marriage, every relation necessitates kindness. It's amazing. They say research, the one characteristics or two characteristics, they say that for, this is a 40-year study of marriages. Those who live well longer and those who end up in disaster or sometimes wish they end up in, end up like, like in divorce. So they did a long-term study in terms of, um, from the Love Institute, uh, they did a long-term study to see what, what makes a good marriage a good marriage. It's amazing. Point number one, kindness. The fact that you do goodness not based on what someone does for you, but goodness based on goodness sake, what the other one needs. And the other one speaks, I think it's patience. It's just, a, just the fact that you endure. You suck it up for a while. You have the ability to suck it up for a while, endure. And this is what this Bible says as well, Ephesians 4. Be completely humble and gentle, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. It's an invitation. What makes Christian community Christian community? The fact that we show kindness. How do we stay together? The fact that we show kindness to one another. Okay. And this fosters gratitude, and gratitude fosters kindness and generosity. Selfless serving. How do we do life together? Selfless serving, like Jesus. Again, yesterday morning, um, I did this afternoon, lunchtime. I did dishes at home, that's what I do. And uh, I told Marguerite, my nine-year-old, so Marguerite, why does Papi always does do the dishes? And she says to me, want Jesus nie gekom om gedien te word nie, maar om ander te dien. It's like, thank you. And it's really as simple as that. Every time I do dishes at home, I say to myself, and the kids know it, that I do dishes because Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom to many. And I do that as a discipline. It is as much a discipline that shapes me as my prayer life. In fact, a little bit more. It's practical. I do it when I don't feel like it. I do it because I need to do it. And I teach my children that this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what Christian community requires. Someone has to serve. And Jesus said the greatest should be the greatest servant. Jesus said, John 13, 15, he says, if I, your Lord and Master, bow down to wash your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. And Jesus didn't intend to start a foot washing ministry, no? His point is, do as I did, don't do what I do, but take the posture of a servant, Philippians 2 says, to serve one another. And this really is, guys, every time I walk into this church and I see three guys sitting behind that desk, two people making coffee, and someone that prepared hours and hours to lead worship, I'm like, thank you, God, for generous servants. It's people who don't do this, they don't get paid for this. This is generosity and kindness. Always seek to do good. Thessalonians says, whenever someone wrongs you, don't repay evil for evil, but always seek to do good to the other. This is just another way of saying to love one another. It's exactly the same phrase, love one another. It's like a serve one another with the gifts that you have. I just want to say some of you, you have stuff that will benefit others, but either you're shy or you're uncertain. I say, please, for God's sake, get out your gifts and serve one another. I think we have time for one more. Grand generosity. I love this one. You've heard me say the word a few times tonight. But Christianity, if Christianity has anything to do, if our church community, if our life together characterizes anything of the life of God. It has to be generosity. It has to be 
the generous serving of who, giving of who we are and what we have to the others. It, it has to be that. It has to be not a storing up for myself or security for myself. It has to be an overflowing of this goodness that I've received. It, it has to be a giving of myself to care for the others. I love the scripture, uh, Galatians 6 verse 2. It says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The image that you have, two images that you should have with that text because of what the Greek language does there. The first image, how many of you know tomato plants? It grows up, you know, not, not these micro tomatoes, but real tomatoes. Right? It grows up and then at some point when it bears fruit and good fruit, the weight of the fruit breaks knock. That's the word for knock. Bends over. <laughs> it knacks. <laughs> Thanks, Tinas. Was all the way It knacks, ne? The, the, the plant and kills it, ne? And this is the image. It says, if the burden is too great, we should stake yourself. The Greek here is stake yourself next to it. Just like we do with a leg that is broken, you stake yourself in it, ne? You, you, put, a, you put, put, put a support structure there. And he's saying, you be that support structure so that the burden does not break the one, does not connect the one who carries the weight. Ne? But it's a grandeur. It says, give yourself so that the other one. It also says, the verse just before that, it says, each one should carry his own load. So in Christian community, sometimes we find that people just don't take ownership of their own life. It says, but we all at times, the load is too much for us whether financial or emotional, because this text goes both ways. It continues to speak. It starts with emotions, spirituality, and then it goes into finances. So this is an all-consuming thing, or an all-encompassing thing. It says, you stake yourself next to the other one so that you, Shema, not fail. So, in conclusion, radical hospitality. How do we do life together? Well, we do radical, like Jesus does, radical hospitality, humble authenticity, be real. Life-giving encouragement. Be one who always waters the other. He who waters the others will himself be watered. Unmerited kindness. To give freely, not because the other one requires it, but because God has been generous to me. Selfless serving. To devote your life to serve and to build a community, not just your own comfort and grand generosity. Father, we thank you for the life that we have together. I thank you, Jesus, that we are one because your spirit is poured out into all of us. And thank you that this evening, God, we can really just enjoy one another and can enjoy company and can enjoy the culture that you've created in this country, God, in this world. Thank you that we are part of this world. We've been set aside for you. And as we, as we watch and enjoy and laugh tonight, God, I pray that you will warm our hearts and strengthen our bonds in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.